The world's appetite for artificial intelligence is fueling a boom in new data centers around the world and driving a surging demand for power. According to the International Energy Agency, energy consumption from data centers is expected to almost double by the end of the decade, which means adding the equivalent of Japan's entire power demand to the global grid. A single data center in the past used to be 10 to 20 me megawatts. Uh, now that number has started to be more 100 to 500 megawatts. And that is the equivalent of uh, almost a small city. So every data center is adding the capacity of electricity needed. Feeding these voracious data centers is no easy task. Groups like AWS are trying to satisfy the huge appetite for data while trying to keep energy emissions to a minimum. It's a combination of energy sources you want to look at uh, across the globe because you're always looking for power stability in running all of these data centers. And so that means that renewable power has to be in that mix, uh, and that includes solar, wind. In the U.S., uh, we've got nuclear today. A greater reliance on renewable energy makes it critical for companies to ensure power grid stability, while at the same time, operators need to look at reducing energy waste. Another factor is going to be energy efficiency or as sometimes the industry called the power usage effectiveness. And many of the data centers are working on reducing that um, coefficient, so i.e. less wastage. To help maintain data centers' energy needs, a lot is hinging on how efficiently operations are run, with cooling technology and even AI advancements being used. Through some of the new cooling technologies we've just introduced, liquid cooling to be specific, we are reducing the mechanical energy drawn into those data centers by 46%. Uh, that's one aspect. The second aspect are the chips. AI, generative AI, is what's really consuming a lot of that power. And so we are working and really building purpose-driven chips that helps reduce the power requirements. And as AI moves from science fiction to a daily tool, the investment in energy and new technology is certain to boom. Now, to be fair also, Martin, the, the future demand for, da uh, for power from data centers will only come out, account for about 4% of global energy demand. So it's still a small fraction, but still it is one of the biggest and fastest growing sources for this energy. The bigger question here is also how you're going to meet the growing demand from en for energy from these emerging markets that are growing quite fast. You're going to see a lot of people getting more disposable income, perhaps upgrading, needing air conditioning, needing other resources for energy. So again, this is a global uh, I issue, but so far the data centers are also at least aware of the fact that they need to diversify and they also need to meet this growing demand. Which sort of raises the question, right? Where's all the power going to come from to, 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 to meet these needs there, right? And I know that we've talked about this before, right? Nuclear, uh, almost suddenly, right, is becoming a real conversation, including in some parts of Southeast Asia. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the likes of AWS, Meta, for instance, and some of the big, uh, big tech giants in the U.S. have been starting to invest in nuclear. But some people who I spoke to at the Silence of the Energy Asia actually said that you might not need nuclear because it's going to take forever, actually, or a long time to actually get some of these SMREs to a functional capacity. Meanwhile, their argument is that the state of solar and wind right now, actually, you generate enough power already to meet this global energy demand, and it's quite abundant. Now, the question is, are the grids and the transmission mechanisms robust enough to handle this? And can you actually plug some of this uh, renewable energy into the grids as it exists? So again, as they mentioned, also some of the people we spoke to, you'll have to reinvest in the grids. You'll have to make sure the grids are resilient and can actually handle this added uh, gen energy generation. But it's interesting because on one hand, you have the renewable guys saying, Everything is there already. It's already on the table. You just need to use this, uh, use the renewable energy that's out there. But some are actually hedging their bets and saying we're going to explore everything, including that of nuclear energy. Yeah, the grid's got to be able to handle it. Is uh, is your point there, right? But I mean, Southeast Asia. When I take a look across the region, you know, the geography, the topography is just so so different, right? So, in terms of uh, renewables, right? Let's not talk about. Let's leave uh, nuclear mm -hmm. aside, right? When you talk about, let's say, uh, wind or something like that, or even hydro, right? It depends where you are. Absolutely. And the one thing they also drove is that you don't have a one-size-fits-all solution, actually. You'll have to look at what actually benefits the and is advantageous for these areas. So for the likes of Malaysia, for instance, you can actually use solar power when you talk about peninsular Malaysia. In Borneo, for instance, uh, geothermal becomes, or, or sorry, hydropower becomes quite important. And when you're talking about wind power, that's more applicable to the likes of Vietnam, for instance. So again, you'll have to treat it as a case-to-case -case basis and evaluate each geography as, uh, uh, as to which renewable energy source actually suits them best. But again, there are sources that can meet that. You just have to, again, make sure that the, so the solutions are tailor-fit.